Good day. And um, today we're just going to be continuing in our, our series as we've been reading through the Bible. And today we're looking at some of the pre-exile prophets, that is, some of the minor prophets uh, who were writing during the time of the judgment of God upon the house of Israel and the house of Judah and how they're going into exile, into Babylon and into Assyria. Uh, later, we come to some of the, the post-exile prophets, people like Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi, who are writing after the exodus, uh, after the exile, sorry. Um, and then, so we've split those up. And so just to recap the story, as it were, we've had the United Kingdom under David and Solomon, and that was divided. And you've got the Northern Kingdom of Israel, and then you've got the Southern Kingdom of of Judah. And there's a number of temples. There's a temple at Bethel uh, and at Dan in the north, and there's a temple of Jerusalem uh, in the south. And we've got evidence, archaeological evidence from the temple at Dan, particularly that it was virtually identical in its layout as the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem. And, you know, the, the, the bones and the things that have been found there um, show that it was um, the worship of Yahweh that was taking place there at Dan. You know, it's the sort of things we'd expect to find if we were to dig up the Temple of Solomon based on the biblical record. So although there was these calf idols there um, that had been placed there, it was also a place where God was worshipped. So now we can just return um, one of the the themes that comes out of the the Old Testament or one of the questions that uh, is raised up in our minds or that we should be thinking about is when Judah and Benjamin return, the southern kingdom of, of Judah returns from their exile in Babylon um, under Ezra, under Nehemiah. But what about the 10 lost tribes? What's happened to the, the northern tribes? Uh, we do have the story that's told in Kings about how uh, there's a mixed people in the north, you know, the people of Ephraim and Manasseh, um, and then also, you know, the priests that are brought back to instruct these Babylonians, or these Assyrians, I should say, people from northern Iraq who've been brought and um, displaced the local population who've gone into exile. And these people are now taught Samaritanism, you know, the, the religion of Samaria. So there's this question is, are the other 10 tribes going to be brought back? Where are they? What's happened to them? Um, are they, how are they going to be restored? Especially in the light of some of the things we're going to be reading this morning, of the words of the prophets. Um, how are they going to find their restoration in the story? How are they going to be regathered? We have to remember that Yahweh God is not just the God of Judah, um, he's the God of Israel as well, and of all the tribes, all 12 tribes were at Mount Sinai. God's holy mountain, as it were, is in Midian, in perhaps modern day Saudi Arabia, Mount Horeb or Sinai. Um, and his wedding, his agreement, his covenant was with all of the 12 tribes. It wasn't just the tribe of Judah who become um, modern Jews um, and the tribe of Benjamin. So there's this question within our minds of what's happened to the lost tribes? Where are they? You know, where were they? Um, how are they going to be regathered and restored in their mission to be salt and light to the world? And Hosea, um, the prophet Hosea, he speaks to Ephraim as a, a name for the northern kingdom. Uh, he marries a prostitute as a prophetic symbol of God's marriage with Israel and Israel's unfaithfulness to him, to God. Uh, they've gone and worshipped other gods, which they should never have done. In Hosea chapter 11, verse 8, we read, How can I give up on you, O Ephraim? How can I surrender you, O Israel? I have had a change of heart. All my tender compassions are aroused. So we're left with the hope that God will in some way restore the fortunes of Ephraim. OK, he's going to restore them in some way or some means in the future. 
we've got the prophet Amos and Amos is a shepherd he he takes cares of of fig trees as well and he receives this prophetic call to go and speak to the northern kingdom of Israel and he accuses Israel and the nations around them of their injustice he warns of judgment against the northern kingdom of Israel because they're failing to be that light to the nations because of their idolatry. In fact, they're worshipping the gods of the nations rather than being a light to the nations. And Amon has this, this vision in the, the temple. Uh, we think it's probably the temple at, at Bethel. Uh, and he sees a glimmer of hope in the restored house of David in the future. So this is hope of the messiah that he's going to come from the line of david you know they've broken away from the the descendants of david and yet there is hope will be from the line of david god will regather the the lost tribes ultimately through his gathering of all the nations back to himself and they seem you know, should be in our minds as we're reading the New Testament, as we're reading the things of the hope of Israel is the restoration of all Israel, not just Judah and Benjamin. So Paul in uh, Romans in chapter 11 writes in 11 and 12, I ask, did they stumble, he's speaking of Israel, into a irrevo irrevocable fall? Did they? Absolutely not. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. Now, if their transgression means riches for the world, their defeat means riches for the Gentiles. How much will their full restoration bring? So Paul is looking forward to a future restoration of all of Israel. The, the nation's acceptance, the Gentiles, you know, the non-Jews, the the nation's acceptance of the Messiah is to make Israel jealous, to make Israel jealous. And so the question arises, where are these lost tribes? And obviously, you know, there's many legends of people who, you know, claim to be the lost tribes, whether in India or further abroad, you know, in Afghanistan or wherever it might be. Even when America, you know, was discovered. Uh, many, perhaps Europeans particularly, interpreted the Native Americans that these might have been some of the lost tribes, which is the basis for the Book of Mormon and, and other things. So, you know, this was in the collective consciousness of, you know, um, Christian thought as well as Jewish thought of where are these lost tribes? And Paul uses the example of an olive tree. And he says some of the branches have been shorn off. They've been, they've been cut off. Um, and wild olives have been grafted in, the Gentiles, they've been grafted in. Um, but those natural branches, which have been cut off because of unbelief, will be grafted back in. Okay, that's his hope, that they will be grafted back in. And we, we read this in Romans 11, 17 to 24. Now, if some of the branches were broken off and you, a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among them, and participated in the richness of the olive root. Do not boast over branches, if you do remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. And then he adds in verse 23 and 24. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you are cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these natural branches be grafted back in to their own olive tree? Okay, so this is a hope. The, the broken off olive branches are going to be grafted back in. And then he, he adds in Romans 11, 24, 25 26 for i do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery brothers and sisters um so that you may not be conceited a partioning hardening has happened to israel partial hardening has happened to israel until the full number of the gentiles has come in and so all israel will be saved okay so this is the hope all israel will be saved once the full number of the gentiles has come in so the end result will be all Israel will be saved. But the present time, we do not see that and even see we hardness of the heart of Judah and Benjamin as well. We Israel towards their Messiah. But we see the nations coming to faith in Israel's God and some of the prophets. 
uh, we shall see, speak about this focus of the nations. So Joel speaks of the day of the Lord. This is a day when God is going to judge what is wrong and he will set about making things right and he will pour out his spirit on all flesh and we're told that God is going to judge the nations of the world and restore his people. Um, so in Joel chapter 2 verse 13 we read, tear your hearts and not your garments, return to the Lord your God for he is merciful and compassionate, slow to anger and boundless in his loyal love, often relenting from um judgment. So the purpose of judgment is to right wrongs and to correct evil. That's a wonderful thought, isn't it? You know, the, the purpose of judgment is to right wrongs and to correct evil. And, you know, there's this promise that he's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh, isn't that? That's a wonderful promise. And this is how God deals with each of us. It's how he deals with me. It's how he deals with you. That it, he doesn't punish us for punishment's sake, but in order to correct us, um, so that we might be useful to him in the future. Obadiah. Obadiah in, in Jewish tradition is the same Obadiah who um, hides the hundred prophets from the persecution of Jezebel in the northern kingdom of Israel. He's thought to be an Edomite. As such, he writes this prophecy against Edom. Uh, Edom's descendants are um, from Jacob's brother Esau, and their kingdom is located in what is southern Israel and Jordan today around Petra. And Obadiah criticizes them for their treatment of Israel and he tells them that one day they will be going to the temple in Jerusalem to worship. So there's this um, for this vision, shall we say, of you know the nations coming to worship Israel's God in Jerusalem. Uh, we've got Jonah, a very well-known story of a runaway prophet who hates the fact that God loves his enemies. And that he wants everyone to come to repentance. So God sends Jonah to Assyria to call them to repentance or they're going to be judged. And the Assyrians are nasty people. You know, they're known for flaying their, their victims alive. You know, that's peeling off all their skin and stuff alive. You know, these are not nice people. And Jonah knows that God is forgiving and that he will forgive them of their crimes. And so he runs in the opposite direction. Eventually, the Assyrians do repent and Jonah gets very annoyed by this. In Jonah chapter four, verse two, we read this. So he prayed to the Lord and said, oh, Lord, this is just what I thought would happen when I was in my own country. This is why I tried to prevent by attempting to escape to Tarshish, because I knew that your gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in mercy, one who relents concerning threatened judgment. He knew that God, if they repented, would turn away from his judgment and not judge them. And as such, you know, he he was upset because God is abounding in mercy and slow to anger. Isn't that a wonderful image, friends? That God concerning us, concerning all of us, is slow to anger and abounding in mercy. May that be at his, our attitude as well to others, to the people that we come into contact with and we're not quick to judgment she says as we judge others so shall we be judged are we also slow to anger and abounding in love and abounding in mercy towards others when they wrong us nahum nahum prophesied the the fall of assyria uh, he says in nahum chapter 3 verse 1 woe to the city guilty of bloodshed he wants us to know that God's goodness and his justice compel him to bring down oppressive nations. The empires that rise will one day fall. This is true of all empires and only the kingdom of God and his Messiah do not end. And this is an important aspect for all of us to grasp at our junction in history, where we are at this moment in time. That all empires that rise will one day fall. And that's true concerning our empires as well as the empires of others. As John declares, the kingdom is not of this world. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50, Paul writes, Now this is what I am saying, brothers and sisters, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. This is an important point that we need to grasp, that the things in the age to come are not made of things perishable. 
things of flesh and blood, this stuff made from the dust of the earth. They need to be made of new mass, made of something enduring, made of spirit, as Paul says, you know, um, something that's made that can endure forever. It doesn't fade away. It doesn't grow weak. Um, we need to have our bodies remade, transformed into a body like Christ that is made of pneuma, something made of imperishable, that it doesn't fade or grow weary. Uh, Habakkuk. Habakkuk speaks of God's judgment over Babylon, and he tells us that in the past, um, Exodus will become an image of a future Exodus. In Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 2 we read, Lord, I have heard the report of what you did. I'm in awe of what you've accomplished. In our time, repeat those deeds. In our time, reveal them again. So he's wanting another exodus, another greater exodus, one that is accomplished in the Messiah. Um, and he warns the nations as well. In Habakkuk chapter 2 verses 12 to 14 we read, Woe to the one who builds a city by bloodshed. He who starts a town by unjust deeds, be sure of this, the Lord of heaven's armies has decreed. The, nefer, the nation's effort will go up in smoke. Their exhausting work will be for nothing. For the recognition of the Lord's sovereign majesty will fill the earth as the waters fill up the seas. So he instructs us to find joy in our current circumstances, knowing that God will judge those empires that rise. And that one day the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. Um, and he says in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, When the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, when the olive trees do not produce, and the fields yield no crops, when the sheep disappear from the pen, and there are no cattle in the stalls, I will rejoice because of the Lord. I will be happy because of the God who delivers me. This is a question for all of us to, to ask ourselves. How do we react when all is stripped away? When the music fades, you know, will we still praise God when things are tough? And these are tough questions for all of us to grasp, all of us to, to meditate on. But in times of suffering, times of trial, to whom do we go? To where do we look? He echoes Job's thoughts in Job chapter 1, verse 21. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return there. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. But may the name of the Lord be blessed. Praise and gratitude should be our attitude. They remind us to point ourselves always upwards to God in Christ. Uh, Micah is from the southern kingdom of Judah and he prophesied the future destruction of Jerusalem and Samaria, the destruction and the future restoration of the kingdom of Judah. He rebukes the, the people of Judah for their dishonesty and for their idolatry and he spoke about Bethlehem as the birthplace of the Messiah. He says in Micah chapter 6, 8, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly before your God. Zephaniah speaks of the Lord's coming judgment upon Jerusalem to purify it. And he says in Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 9, Know for sure that I will then enable the nations to give me acceptable praise. All of them will invoke the Lord's name when they pray and, all, and will worship him in unison. So we've got here a promise of the Messiah. And through him, the, the lost tribes are going to be regathered. The nations are going to turn to the God of Israel. We know, know for sure that I will enable the nations to give you acceptable praise, give me acceptable praise. And all of them will invoke the Lord's name when they praise. This is the vision, folks. This is the end, is that all of the nations of the earth are going to be invoking the Lord's name when they pray. That is the end scene. You know, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
So the message again and again is that judgment comes so that God punishes evil. But the purpose of the judgment is to purify, not to punish. He will restore the fortunes of Israel. He will restore the fortunes of Judah. All Israel will be saved. Um, God wants to restore them after judgment. So the judgment is not forever. Psalm 30 verses uh, four and five. Sing to the Lord, you faithful followers of his. Give thanks to his holy name, for his anger lasts only for a brief moment. His good favour restores one's life. One may experience sorrow during the night, but joy arrives in the morning. And this is a wonderful thought, isn't it? You know, for his faithful followers to sing and to remember. His anger lasts for a brief moment, but his good favour restores life that's a wonderful thought isn't it that, that anger might come in judgment but then his favor restores even wicked sodom where we get all of our images of fire brimstone judgment that are used again throughout the scriptures will one day be restored we read in ezekiel chapter 16 verses 53 i will restore their fortunes the fortunes of sodom and her daughters and the fortunes of samaria and her daughters, along with your fortunes among them. Samaria, Judah, Sodom. All of them will be restored. All of them will be restored. It's a wonderful thought of the restoration of all things in that sense, isn't it? It's a wonderful thought for us to, to think about, to dwell upon, to meditate on, is even wicked Sodom will one day be restored. Okay, so in conclusion, and I just love it the way it's put here in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 32 verse uh, 39. See now that I, indeed I am he, says the Lord, and there is no other God besides me. I kill and I give life. I smash and I heal. None can resist my power. But notice the, the order from Moses here. He says, I kill and I give life. I smash and I heal. Death comes before life. Winter before spring. This is true of our Lord Jesus Christ, who by his death tramples down death and then raised to life again um, from the dead by God the Father. But it's also true in your life. that All of us have to go through death in order to be born to life eternal to be clothed in that immortal flesh so all of us have to go through death in order to experience life all of us have to go through hard times times of trouble times of difficulty in order to then receive life uh, this moment is creation isn't yet fully created because it's being birthed you know and paul talks about that doesn't he you know that creation He's going through birth pangs until the children of God are revealed. It's um, the creation still isn't fully finished until the end. You know, uh, this is a process. We're part of the birthing of creation. Um, so it's the killing before life is comes. You know that the the tomb is a womb for life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for all of these thoughts. So we're meditating on the, the minor prophets, Lord, as they're speaking about the judgment upon Israel and Samaria, that we know that you will restore their fortunes as you restore ours. That though we will face death and judgment, you will restore us also because of your goodness, because of your faithfulness in the Messiah. Amen.